Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture 4 uh, of uh, this course optimal control guidance and estimation. So, so far we have seen some uh, some overview of this course uh, followed by some uh, I mean some overview of topics uh, related to systems theory as well as uh, matrix algebra and, uh, uh, and numerical methods as well that is relevant in this course actually. So, and uh, another thing that is very much relevant in this course is uh, the concept of static optimization. That means, we are not talking about uh, time varying variables and all, but uh, these are constant numbers associated with that, but the in general they have some objective and all that, how do you optimize that actually. Okay, so, that kind of things are called static optimization or sometimes it is uh, popularly known as parameter optimization as well, because parameters are something that typically remain constant actually. Okay, so, anyway, so those, those are uh, uh, the topics of discussion of this particular lecture and also remember uh, as I told you in the beginning uh, lecture the uh, for very first lecture that one way of solving this uh, this optimal control problem is to go heavily to this uh, static optimization ideas and uh, convert the problem entirely to a large dimensional static optimization problem and solve it that is called transcription method and all we will see that uh, as, we, as the course uh, develops. Another motivation of that is even if you formulate this optimal control problem from calculus or variation point of view and all that, you essentially land up with some equation uh, something called Hamiltonian and all that and that happens to be like every point it happens to be kind of a constant quantity in its variables state and control and that you need to minimize at every point of time uh, in the framework of static optimization actually. This is very relevant concept uh, for, for optimal control in general. So, it obviously makes sense to have overview of static optimization before we go to the dynamic optimization that means uh, optimal control synthesis and all actually. So, this uh, I will take it in uh, two parts and the first lecture will talk about some overview or some uh, some standard results of static optimization along with some examples and all that, that way. Then further topics on, on, on it we will see in the next lecture and before proceeding to the calculus of variation ideas and all that, that way. Okay. So, the topics of this lecture is something like this we will first discuss about uh, unconstrained optimization then we will go to this constraint optimization with equality constraints primarily. Inequality constraints and all we will uh, see in the next lecture actually. Okay, then we will see some, some numerical examples as well. All right. So, first is unconstrained optimization and the problem definition turns out to be very clear that you want to optimize some variable some, some function uh, of variables, but the variables are combination of some uh, non time varying quantities actually. Okay, so, that is uh, they are not constrained by any any constant equation either actually. Before proceeding with the with the algebra and then analysis and things like that, let us see a very simple straightforward idea first actually. Now, forget it for a second this this j 2 dotted line and all this plot uh, is plot was x versus some some function j 1 let us say and j 1 turns out to be this function this uh, solid uh, function actually. And then very quickly we can see that this point 1, 2, 3, 4 they mean something to us in a, in just by looking at the plot actually. And uh, very easily it can be argued that this point 1 happens to be a local maximum and point 2 is well we cannot say anything about that it is a flat thing, but certainly a candidate for, uh, for uh, getting worried about. And then uh, it is called point of inflection and all that and then point 3 turns out to be a local minimum and point 0.4 turns out to be local maximum. Just by looking at the plot we can very easily see that this is what is happening actually. And then it also we can see that point 0.3 turns out to be global minimum and point 0.4 turns out to be global maximum because nothing else is bigger than that in this domain of course, I mean x i to x v and all that, that way. But when you talk about uh, global maximum and all typically this x i and x v are also not there. In other words, you talk about minus infinity plus infinity that domain sort of thing actually. But anyway, within this constraint, then you can think that okay, four happens to be the global maximum and three happens to be the global minimum actually. And one uh, one property that we observe, simply observe, is that all these points one, two, three, four, uh, this relationship is true. That means uh, the gradient of j with respect to x is zero. If I just take a tangent here, that is flat. This is anyway flat. If I take a tangent here, it's, it's flat, and then it is. Uh, 
if I take a tangent at the fourth point, then they also parallel to the x axis actually. So, all the points will satisfy that. Now, that would gives us a clue that when you talk about uh, something about optimization, then obviously, the first derivative turns uh, should happen to be 0, that is our intuitive guess actually. Now, does it really happen? So, let us uh, talk about that uh, that way and also remember that instead of j 1, suppose you have j 2, okay, then we really do not have to worry about all these, you just have to worry about one minimum, okay, that is what all that it will have is one minimum and that one minimum happens to be the global minimum as well actually. Okay. So, most of the time we will take advantage of this observation and while we construct a function, we will want to construct it that way. So, that we really do not have to bother about uh, global things and all is not relevant also, most of the time it, it will satisfy our need also basically that way. This is quadratic function and all that we will talk later. Okay. So, this is how it turns out to be. Now, coming back to that, uh, whether this relationship satisfied for, for all the points and all, then analyze it little bit mathematical rigorous sense basically. So, now again we go back to this, uh, this uh, Taylor series and all which will repeatedly require anyway. Now, remember uh, what is a local maximum? Local maximum tells you that if point 1 is a local maximum, then very next to it whether you go left side or right side either way that will give you a function value which is lesser than the function value at point 1. Similarly, if it is point 3, if it is a minimum local minimum, then you whether you go left side or right side either direction you are going to get higher values than what you get at point 3 actually. Okay. So, that kind of concept is this. So, let us analyze a, a, a point x star and then talk about a value of that function around x star and remember delta x can be either positive or negative actually here. Okay. And also remember you are simply talking about a scalar quantity that means uh, x is just a single I mean single component, j, j, contain, j is a function of x, but x does not contain x 1, x 2 components and all that, x is just a scalar variable sort of thing. Okay. Then what happens, x star plus delta x minus j of x star that is the term what will come from Taylor series like this actually. Okay. Now, for any hope to have, so what you are looking for, we are looking for this quantity j of x star plus delta x should be greater than j of x star, okay, if j of x star happens to be a minimum point irrespective of the direction of delta x or the sign of delta x really actually. Okay. So, if that has to happen that means, this left side quantity has to be strictly positive for, for, it, the, for this quantity to be you know, local minimum or it has to be strictly negative for the other case actually local maximum case. So, what you are looking at here is a sign independent property really. Okay. And also remember this Taylor series has uh, this uniform convergence property and things like that. So, that means, if you write this, this expression to be something like that, if you take uh, this uh, this entire quantity, what you, what turns out to be like this, okay, the infinite terms what you are talking here is uh, less dominant compared to the first term actually. Okay. So, that is uh, how it will turn out to be. So, in other words, the, the sign of it is largely dictated by the first term itself actually okay. and not by these this terms actually that way. So, if you have any real hope of that the, this becomes sign insensitive, then uh, it turns out that uh, the first term must be going to 0, then only we have some hope actually. Okay. Now, that is how the necessary condition turns out to be and remember delta x is not 0, so, but this quantity has to be 0, that means the coefficient has to be 0 basically. So, that is how it turns out that uh, if del j by del x at x equal to x star is, a, is 0, then x star happens to be a candidate point, I mean we can we still cannot tell whether it is minimum or maximum actually. Okay. So, for that we will we will go to the next one and, and then tell okay, if that uh, that is already there that means at this point this is 0 anyway, then this quantity turns out to be that one and that one means I can consider the second order term and then there is a still higher order terms uh, uh, from third order, third order, fourth order and all I can neglect actually. Okay. So, if this still has to be positive that means uh, this has to be greater than this irrespective of the sign of delta x, remember this is a square term now. Okay. So, this has to be strictly greater than 0 provided this is greater than 0, okay. now this is greater than 0 anyway. Okay. So, this quantity is greater than 0 provided this quantity happens to be greater than 0, that means second order term has to be greater than 0 basically. And similarly, if the second order term happens to be less than 0, it will lead to the conclusion that this term is less than 0, in other words this term happens to be a maximum actually, the x star happens to be a maximum. So, this is how the, how the analysis to, to, to summarize the things, uh, wh what we are doing here is given any function j of x, we will uh, we'll put this uh, del j by del x equal to 0 and then solve this and find out candidate points x star need not be one point, it can be several points actually 
and for at each of the points we will try to evaluate the second order derivative okay. and the second order derivative happens to be 0 then it is a minimum point the second derivative happens to be less than 0 it is lo a local minimum that is the sufficiency condition actually. So, before carrying out further things and all let us uh, see this uh, uh, some example sort of thing and uh, before even before the example ok. Now, the question is uh, what if this both the derivatives are 0, but the third order derivative is not 0 ok. So, that means, th th this is true whatever we talked about only if the second derivative is non 0 okay. Now, if the second order derivative also happens to be 0, then we have no choice but to go to the um, third derivative and the third derivative happens to be non 0 ok. Then we really cannot tell whether it is uh, strictly positive or strictly negative and hence it turns out to be a point of inflection actually ok. And if it is just, I mean, if you still have a hope of getting it uh, something like a positive or negative, you have to, you must have the third derivative also 0 and then go to the fourth derivative and things like that actually, okay. right. If it is second derivative is 0, then this lands up with the third derivative case and then there is a necessary condition of optimality is uh, if you still have any hope, then third derivative has to be 0, then you land up with fourth derivative. And if the fourth derivative happens to be non-zero, that means uh, positive, then it leads to minimum and maximum, and otherwise it is maximum actually. So the analysis continues. It actually toggles between this uh, this odd power and even power sort of thing actually. So as a necessary condition, all odd powers has to be zero, and sufficiency condition will come from even powers actually. Okay. So this is how the things proceed. And uh, suppose we want to get an example here. Then it turns out to be. Let's take a very simple example. J equal to x fourth, and you can see that. Uh, well, the x fourth uh, plot is very, very, very close to this. This kind of uh, okay, very similar to x square sort of thing. So obviously we know that uh, this is the point of minimum. That means x equal to zero is is the answer. We know that actually. Yeah, so, whether you get it or not, let us see that using these results. So, if you have uh, j something like this, okay, then del j by del x is 4 x q equal to 0, okay. then your solution of that is uh, 3 quantities, but all happens to be 0, that x star equal to 0, 0, 0. And then okay, let us go to the second derivative and second derivative turns out to be like for taking this term, it is 12 x square and x star equal to 0 means 12 x square is also 0. So, we, we really have to go to third derivative now. And then the third derivative fortunately happens to be 24 x from here 12 into 2 24 into x star. So, next star is 0 anyway. So, the third derivative is also 0. So, that means there is still our hope is alive actually. Then you go to fourth derivative and fourth derivative happens to be 24 which is greater than 0. Okay. So, if the fourth derivative is greater than 0 then obviously, it tells you that okay, my, uh, my some of my all of my odd powers are 0 and the first even power that I encountered is actually greater than 0. So, obviously, x star is a minimum point actually. That is how you conclude that uh, the result is compatible to what we know actually from, from graphical sense. Now, example 2 what if x is j is just x q and remember x q uh, what is the type of uh, I mean thing plot x q is something like this if it positive is positive, if it is negative is negative something like this. So, here uh, you we have uh, a point of inflection really that means, uh, at, at 0 what you are talking here is uh, one side the second derivative will turn out to be I mean uh, one side the function turns out to be increasing other side the function turns out to be decreasing actually. So, this will this is we know that it is a point of inflection now whether our analysis tells, us the, tells that or not let us see. So, if you have j equal to x q then del j by del x is nothing but 3 x square equal to 0 ok. So, x star turns out to be 0, 0. Okay. Now, you have uh, two candidate solutions, but both happens to be identical anyway. Now, the second derivative happens to be 6 x square is also 0. So, we cannot conclude anything this this point of time because this is 3 x square. So, it will be 6 x. So, 6 x evaluated at x star that is 6 x star x star is 0. So, it is still 0 basically. Now, we, we have to go to third derivative and third derivative del q by del q j by del x q for coming from here is nothing but 6. But the important point to note here is not whether 6 is positive or negative, but 6 is not equal to 0. Remember, it is a third order derivative actually, okay, odd power derivative. So, the, this odd power derivative has to be non equal, to, I mean not equal to 0, that is more important actually. If it is not equal to 0, your, your hope is uh, not alive, your conclusion has uh, already been there, and the conclusion is. Uh, the x star is a point of inflection because if I if I take this series, okay, this series this term will start dominating, 
and if delta x is positive okay depending on whatever sign is there it will lead to one sign and depending on whatever sign is there here if delta x is negative it will lead to exactly opposite say, conclusion here so it's just one side it is uh, either increasing or decreasing but the other side it is just the opposite actually so this will turn out to be point of inflection so that is how it is uh, there so if j equal to x cube then uh, x star equal to 0 turns out to be a point of inflection point actually a point of inflection really so it is all compatible to what we know basically now but this is not end of the story this is just a very beginning uh, it is it talks about a scalar variable function sort of thing actually but we are not interested in, uh, in a scalar variable function in general because we, we deal with systems theory where states can be n dimensional control can be n dimensional like that so it is a mixture of uh, this uh, components of the state variable really okay. so that is what we want to analyze then it leads to this vector case okay. and the problem is turns out to be like that minimize j of x where x is a n dimensional vector and remember the objective function is always a scalar quantity unless otherwise you talk about multi objective optimization and all that we are not talking about that uh, at all in this course actually. So when somebody talks about a standard optimization problem then it turns out to be that the optimization function uh, is, a, is a scalar quantity okay. whereas the, the variables can be n dimensional there can be several variables playing each, uh, playing out uh, different contributions and all we want to minimize this scalar quantity finally and also remember this is uh, this is an unconstrained problem that means this component of x uh, are not constrained by any constraint actually okay you can they can take any values uh, whatever whatsoever actually that way so we want to analyze that problem and see what is going on actually okay and uh, also remember by definition uh, what you saw on this matrix uh, theory uh, reviews and all that also that by definition this is del j by del x equal to like this okay by is, uh, this is nothing but the gradient vector and del square j by del x square hessian matrix turns out to be like that by definition actually and these things we will need yeah. okay now again the going by the similar concept uh, this optimization ideas and all now we are asking a question that we want a value x star where from x star you do go whatever direction you want okay no matter whatever direction left right top bottom whatever it is actually which, whichever direction you go you will get some value which is uh, strictly greater than the value at x star okay or you will get a value which is all of which are strictly less than a value of j x star basically okay. then only you can talk about whether it is a minimum or a maximum quantity sort of thing actually okay and picture really again if somebody wants to picture then they can, in a 2d sense you can think about this kind of a picture uh, okay this is not uh, the, this kind of a picture actually so if you have a minimum point somewhere no matter which direction you look at it okay you can think of it something like a uh, uh, increasing function in all directions sort of thing. So, you, no matter which direction you go in okay, you will end up with uh, higher values compared to the minimum point actually. Okay. So, that kind of uh, uh, questions we are talking about actually. So, again going back to this idea of Taylor series, we know there is a, this uh, this vector uh, variable also we can uh, use this Taylor series expansion. So, we talk about j of x is nothing but j of x star which is x star happens to be a candidate point to analyze uh, for maximum or minimum and then uh, j of x star plus delta x can be expanded that way okay remember this is the first term j of x star plus the linear term eval j del j by del x evaluated at x star into delta x plus this second order term which is 1 by 2 factorial delta x transpose into this hessian matrix times delta x and then higher order terms actually okay and in this case we will not uh, be very adventurous to go to this third order fourth order derivatives and all that it is still possible to write but mathematically they are quite complex actually to uh, write in long and algebra sort of thing actually. So, let us see the idea first in, in this context and most of the time this is sufficient for us also basically ok. So, for minimization problem what you are looking at is this quantity this uh, j of x star plus delta x minus uh, j of x star that quantity has to be strictly positive that means no matter which direction you go the delta x can be any direction ok component by component they can take any positive negative any quantity whatsoever actually then it turns out that okay if my value turns out to be higher than that then it is a minimum point actually ok. So, obviously if I want to satisfy this then uh, again going by this idea of uh, direction sensitive information and all that we can always tell that okay if my hope is alive that means I really want to conclude is, uh, have a conclusion something like that very precisely then it turns out that my this term what you see as first order term has to be 0 ok otherwise uh, if I have uh, something non-zero here ok the coefficient sense 
then depending on this quantity delta x which can be positive or negative whatever component sense, I will land up with an idea of this, this quantity can be either positive or negative. So, it becomes direction sensitive actually and which we do not need. Okay. So, it turns out that okay, if you really want to have a minimum point then uh, this first order Jacobian matrix uh, Jacobian vector, vector rather uh, sorry it is gradient vector. So, gradient vector has to be 0. Okay. So, that this uh, this multiplication uh, has to be I mean uh, turns out to be 0 basically. Okay. This is a small probably a, a print mistake sort of thing okay. this has to be transpose actually. Okay. Because we talk about this uh, del j by del x being a column vector and all that actually. So, the multiplication will be defined only when it is a row vector actually. Okay. Anyway, so this is what it is. Uh, so, del j by del x uh, evaluated at x star transpose and things like that actually. Okay. So, so, for minimization again this again to summarize for minimization we want this to be strictly positive. So, the necessary condition turns out to be something like this and the sufficiency condition again going by the earlier ideas. So, with the, once this is 0 we will end up with this term and this term has to be positive strictly positive for all delta x non 0. Okay. And if you remember this del square j by del x square once it is evaluated at x star it is actually nothing but a matrix of numbers basically. Okay. So, this matrix of numbers multiplied with some vector transpose and uh, right multiplied with the same vector with non trivial vector and all that it has to be strictly positive quantity. That means, by definition of uh, what we saw in matrix theory the equivalent uh, idea is this matrix what you are seeing here by definition has to be positive definite. Okay. By, because the positive definite definition tells us that anything that uh, we multi pre multiply with some vector transpose and post multiply with that same vector okay, which is a non trivial vector and that has to be strictly positive for all such vectors basically. By definition this uh, in that case this matrix turns out to be positive definite. So, and also remember positive definite is tightly linked with Eigen values and all that and del square j by del x square is guaranteed to be symmetric matrix that means, the Eigen values are guaranteed to be real. So, if it is uh, real and it is uh, all Eigen values are guaranteed to be greater than equal to 0 because it is a positive semi definite matrix I mean uh, it uh, sorry I am uh, take it back uh, this is a symmetric matrix. So, Eigen values are all real actually. Okay. Now, it turns out that uh, if it is a positive definite matrix okay, by this analysis that I just told then Eigen values are going to be all positive actually. Okay. So, just by looking at the Eigen values of this matrix because it is a constant matrix uh, after getting evaluated at x star if all Eigen values are guaranteed to be positive and remember it is guaranteed to be real in any case okay, then it turns out to be positive definite and if it is positive definite then this term turns out to be strictly greater than 0 uh, for, for uh, all possible delta x no matter whatever direction of delta x is and then hence this this relation will be, will be valid actually. Okay. So, as a summary what turns out that the, the necessary condition which is can be given like this that means, uh, your uh, gradient vector evaluated at x star has to be 0 and then whatever candidate solution you get from there you go to the sufficiency condition and tell okay, uh, if I evaluate this uh, uh, Jacobian matrix at, uh, at uh, values x star all possible values x star and then I see whether the Jacobian matrix uh, turns out to be positive definite or not actually. Okay. And if it is positive definite the x star is a minimum solution if it is negative definite on the other hand it is a maximum solution actually. And also as a remark further conditions like third order, fourth order and all are, are difficult to use in practice and uh, typically it is not uh, required as well in most of the applications actually. Anyway, so this uh, and rather most of the engineering applications I will say that way okay, then, uh, many times we will end up with uh, such cases that it turns out that first order and second order turns out to be sufficient actually. Yeah. But that does not mean that the mathematically we cannot develop further and all that actually, that that can always be there basically. Anyway, coming back to the example, uh, suppose we take an example of two dimensional case now, half of x1 square plus x2 square, we want to see the where the minimum lies and all that that way. Then as a necessary condition, I will first go through that, this uh, del j by del x, I will evaluate at x, uh, I will put it at equal to 0. Remember this is a vector equation, that means it has two equations actually in, in embedded in that. So, essentially it tells you that del j by del x1 and del j by del x2 equal to 0, 0. But del j by del, del x1 uh, from this expression is nothing but x1 and del j by del x2 is nothing but x2. So, evaluated at x star that means this star things and all. So, this has to be 0, 0. That means, uh, as I told again this picture real representation is what I have shown you already. 
okay this is uh, picture really we know this result actually okay okay next one next two and and things like that this is j okay and we know the solution already here actually 0 0 okay turns out to be the same actually from the math okay now the question is can we verify sufficiency condition my answer is very much yes uh, you can go to see once we have the uh, once we have the gradient vector we can talk about the hessian matrix actually so del square j by del x square evaluated at x star turns out to be something like this and remember this is the gradient vector so take second order derivative this this variable okay this is only x1 this is only x2 so if i take with respect to x1 one more time i will get 1 if i take variable derivative with respect to x2 there is nothing there because it's a function of x1 only so that is zero similarly if you talk this one this turns out to be again the only function of only x2 okay so if i take partial derivative with respect to x1 again then it turns out to be zero here and if i take x2 this is one okay so this grad this hessian matrix evaluated at x star turns out to be nothing but identity matrix actually here okay so identity matrix is certainly a diagonal matrix and we all know that eigen values are all diagonal entries actually nothing but 1 1 1 and all that actually that way so the eigen values of this particular uh, hessian matrix is nothing but 1 and 1 both are greater than 0 and hence this matrix uh, evaluated at x star which is 0 0 uh, even this matrix evaluated at x star happens to be a positive definite matrix okay so what it turn out to be like we got a solution 0 0 a candidate solution and the second order analysis that means the hessian matrix evaluated at that point happens to be strictly a positive definite matrix because all the eigen values are strictly greater than 1 greater than 0 basically okay. so because of that uh, this point is guaranteed to be a minimum point it satisfies both necessary condition coming from here and sufficiency condition coming from here which tells us that the it is a diagonal matrix and hence it is eigen values are diagonal entries positive numbers hence it is a positive definite matrix basically all right so let us move further and what if uh, this kind of an example instead x1 square minus x2 square uh, then the ball game is completely different and it turns out to be similar algebra you get a candidate solution as 0 0 however when you go to the second derivative it turns out to be 1 and minus 1 okay so the eigen values are 1 and minus 1 so it is really neither positive definite nor negative definite but strictly speaking you can think okay if i go along x1 direction something happens if i go along x2 direction exactly the opposite thing happens and typical example is the this uh, i don't know this uh, horseback and all that they talk about right i mean this uh, seat on the horseback and all that uh, so that uh, picture really i don't know I, can i write it that way I see this kind of a thing the function will decrease this way and this is this will increase the other way around actually okay so if you imagine something this direction the function will decrease but this direction the function will increase sort of thing actually. so this is the case where you talk about uh, not a point of inflection because that's the idea of a scalar variable so here it is something called a saddle point actually okay so this this is the point where in uh, one direction in x1 direction things will increase but in, uh, in x2 direction the, the function will decrease actually okay so in this case uh, it uh, mathematically it turns out that uh, del square j by del x square evaluated at x star is neither positive definite nor negative definite and hence uh, but the first uh, gradient vector is 0 0 anyway so in such cases uh, this is nothing but a settle point actually okay now moving on uh, what about constraint optimization and then when you talk about uh, when you talk about free optimization like this what you saw there again these are not very meaningful thing because most of the time will be constrained by some relationship between the variables and again and again i keep i'll keep on emphasizing that in uh, in optimization and optimal control everywhere constraint has the priority actually okay that means uh, your solution will have absolutely no meaning if it doesn't satisfy the constraint so you have their constraints uh, first you satisfy the constraint and within that constraint only you try to optimize actually and uh, in general it happens in real life as well actually we have to cater for constraints first and uh, and then talk about optimization around that basically so that's how we are dealing with and when you talk about constraints the constraints can be of two type uh, one can be equality and inequality and the other can be inequality and then we'll, uh, in this particular lecture we'll see about equality constraints uh, and then inequality we'll talk about that in the next lecture actually yeah. so the analysis goes to be a little more uh, complex and things like that way actually 
But also remember, as a combination of equality and inequality constraint is what is what will happen in real life problems actually. Okay, so we should know how to handle equality constraints, and we should also know how to handle inequality constraints as well in general, basically. Anyway, so let's talk about equality constraints here. Okay, the problem formulation is like this: We want to minimize some j of x. Again, always j is a scalar, but x is a vector. Subject to this is set of equality constraint. It's not just one constraint actually. Remember that. So this equation actually is m equations because f has components f1 to fn. Okay. So now the, this is the problem. We want to minimize the scalar quantity uh, of a function where uh, the function itself is n-dimensional, and that is subjected to m m constraints actually m algebraic constraints. Okay. Now the solution procedure relies on this uh, so-called Lagrange existence theorem and all that. Which tells us that uh, if I formulate another cost function like this, okay, or another uh, this uh, objective function and all that, j bar, which is nothing but j of x plus lambda transpose f of x. Okay. So the theorem tells us that uh, if I introduce a function like this and interpret, okay, for a second you forget that f of x equal to zero. That means this is zero anyway, basically, no matter what. But for for a second, you can forget that, and then tell okay, what if lambda is a free variable, and I don't worry about this constraint really, but I just want to put this f of x here, and I want to minimize this function rather, j bar of x, okay, considering lambda is a free variable actually, okay, and also okay, just a small comment before we move ahead. Uh, most of the time, I'll talk about minimization, and most of the textbooks and most of the lectures will also talk about that, uh, different courses. The reason here is uh, if uh, something uh, we want to maximize, the negative of that is something that we want to minimize, basically. So just by introducing a negative sign, uh, the minimum can be interpreted as maximum and vice versa actually. So it doesn't uh, have that much of a great importance to segregate this and talk uh, segregation sense all the time actually. So we'll confine ourselves to discussions around minimization all the time without loss of generality, of course. Anyway, so coming back, uh, this is the theorem which tells us that if I formulate an augmented function like this, that means j bar equal to j plus lambda transpose f, okay, then if I consider j bar as a function of x and lambda both, both are equally free basically, and I consider this as a free optimization with respect to x and lambda both, okay, then it is equivalent to solving this fun this optimization problem subject to this constraint. This is a great theorem. I mean, uh, I, uh, this uh, it's a little bit math heavy also, but uh, those of you are interested can see some some fun, I mean some vector space optimization books and all that it's that way. We will not go to that that much of thing. Again, this course is primarily meant for engineers and engineering flavor and all that that way. So let's come back to that. The theorem essentially tells us that if I constitute a J bar like this, J plus lambda transpose f of s, where lambda is a set of free variables. And again and again, I'm emphasizing because similar concept will use in optimal control also, basically. So if I if I constitute this function and consider this as a free very free optimization problem in terms of x and lambda both, then it is equivalent of solving this problem. This is j of x minimized subject to this actually. Okay. So using that, this gives us a solution procedure, and the solution procedure tells us that okay, first you formulate this this j bar okay like this, and then carry out it as if it is a free optimization problem. And remember, the number of variables are now x and lambda. That means I have to satisfy simultaneously this del j bar del x equal to zero and del j bar del lambda also equal to zero. Now, when you talk about del j by del del j bar by del x, it turns out to be from de this definition. This is nothing but del j by del x coming from this term and the second term. Okay. And remember, if you do this algebra, del j by del x of this using this uh, one of the standard results of uh, this. Uh, Vector matrix calculus that we discussed in uh, in the review class the before this this lecture, then it turns out to be del j by del x of this happens to be this result actually. That means uh, this this derivative del f by del x transpose happens to be in the left hand side. It will shift from right hand to left hand actually. Okay. So this is how we will get it. Okay, so del j bar by del x is this one uh, equal to zero. And remember, lambda is also a free variable. That means del j bar by del lambda is equal to zero. But what is del j bar by del lambda by definition? Okay, this is nothing but f of x. So f of x equal to zero, which is which came from here, is part of the necessary condition anyway. Okay, so we are accounting for the constraint, but that is how it is equivalent actually in a way. Okay, that way. So what we are doing here is uh, this one del j bar by del x, which is equal to zero, 
and del j bar del lambda which is also equal to 0. This will give us an n equation and this will give us m equation because lambda is m dimension remember that this this lambda is same dimension f f is m dimension actually. So, this is actually leads to something like an n plus m equations in n plus m variables basically and uh, these are n equation these are m equation. So, totally n plus m equation and free variable since we have x as n dimensional free variables and lambda as m dimensional free variables. So, we have this n plus m very very variables actually. So, we have a compatible set of equation we need to solve it together and also after the solution uh, after we get the solution uh, we typically are not bothered about lambda we are bothered about the value of x actually. Okay. So, this is something like uh, you can think of it as uh, something like a catalyst operator in a chemical reaction and things like that way actually. So, catalyst itself uh, kind of facilitates the reaction, but ultimately the catalyst is not a product that you are interested in and all that actually, but uh, without that you cannot carry out the reaction probably many times. Yeah. Anyway, so this is uh, how it is. Uh, so, let us go to an example again. Uh, so, we want to have minimize the same thing whatever example we saw before, but not as a free optimization problem that we know that 0 0 happens with the solution, but this time it is constrained to a linear equation let us say x 1 plus x 2 equal to 2 that is nothing but uh, something like a surface something like a plane equation sort of thing actually. So, this uh, this example that I gave you here uh, uh, this one is now subjected to I do not know the what way it is inclined, but uh, let me just conceptually draw one ok. This case this is this is a plane that we are talking about and this plane actually this this plane goes and cuts this uh, I mean this paraboloid and all that, that way. So, we will end up with something like a inclined parabola sort of thing and then in that you talk about what is my maximum minimum value actually. I am not interested in 0 0 anymore. Okay. So, this is the type of problem that you are interested in and then uh, the result turns out to be I mean the procedure turns out to be like that uh, j bar we constitute first. So, this is coming from here followed with remember this only one equation this is one single lambda again. So, lambda in into this f of x so, this is my j bar and uh, first I have to do del j bar by del x and these are two equations here bec because x contains x 1 and x 2. So, it is del j bar by del x 1 equal to 0 and del j bar by del x 2 equal to 0. Then the third equation has to be del j bar by del lambda and lambda is scalar here. So, del j bar by del lambda is nothing but that is equal to 0. So, you carry out this algebra del j bar by del x 1 ok if you see this expression one is coming x 1 is from here and then it, this one more term here. So, this is lambda start uh, lambda here and of, of course, uh, from here to here we change sometimes this star notations and all because these are candidate solutions. These are generic expressions and all that. So, do not get confused that way. So, you get del j bar by del x 1 this term coming from here and this term coming from here that is equal to 0. The similarly, x del j bar by del x 2 this term comes here and then that term because of that term it will come here both are equal to 0. And then del j bar by del lambda, if I talk about this expression, lambda means I get this equation. So, it is x, x 1 plus x 2 minus 2 equal to 0 sort of thing. So, I have to solve these 3 equations with 3 unknowns now x 1 and x 2 and lambda basically. So, if I go ahead and solve it uh, from this first two equations, I get this kind of a relationship, and uh, from the last equation, if I put it back, then it turns out to be that uh, lambda star is nothing but minus 1, and hence uh, x 1 star and x 2 star both happens to be 1 1 actually. And that also happens to be kind of if you imagine a little bit here, then ok, I do not know, it requires a little bit imagination and all that, it depends on the plane inclination and things like that. So, this point, what ok, sorry, ok, this, uh, this point happens to be our point, but this is a projection if you take it here, something like this 1 1 will come actually, ok. Okay, so, this is uh, depends on the plane inclination, what, what inclination, with what inclination the plane cuts the paraboloid sort of thing actually. All right, so that is uh, uh, that's the kind of relationship what you're looking for. Now, okay, generalizing this results a little bit further, uh, you can also think of uh, minimizing some sort of a generic expression where a and b variables can be thought about as uh, weighting parameters and all that, and subject to a generic straight line uh, kind of uh, not straight line generic uh, equation of plane sort of thing actually. Okay. So, where this uh, if this in these expressions where a, b, c, m, and c, all these are uh, kind of constant quantities. But if you take different numbers, you get different uh, solutions ultimately. Actually. So, this is a kind of generalization of what we saw here. Actually, okay. So, again you can go back and solve it j bar is nothing but that and then you can have a lambda plus this uh, this quantity 
and then I can carry out with the algebra same algebra del j bar by del x 1 that turns out to be like that equal to 0 del j bar by del x 2 turns out to be like that equal to 0 and del j bar by del lambda will, will give us the same constant equation that is also equal to 0. So, you solve it in a generic sense and it, the solution turns out to be like that. And also a small comment here that lambda star has no physical meaning and it, uh, it helps as I told uh, to solve the problems actually. Okay. That means, it is you can think of it as something like a catalyst actually. But also remember without the, this, this lambda uh, we may not be able to solve this problem in, in a very good way though. Of course, uh, we can talk about numerical solution and all that, but if whenever you have a closed form expression obviously, we do not want numerical solutions either actually. But anyway, come uh, numerical uh, ideas, philosophy, a little bit of that we can see it in, uh, in the next lecture actually. Let us not go to that part of the story there. Now, what about sufficiency condition? I mean, these are all necessary conditions anyway, and uh, I will not go into the derivation part of it, but it turns out that uh, you formulate this matrix, what you see here inside the determinant. Okay, we talk about a second order matrix, I mean, of J bar, remember that it is Hessian matrix for J bar in terms of only x, okay. then minus i sigma this is a matrix by itself and essentially what you are doing here is creating a matrix out of this partition matrices and all that. I can think of putting putting a partition matrix here okay, like that and I, I constitute this uh, I mean this uh, components individually this is a matrix or rather a sub matrix this is a sub matrix vector sort of thing depending or matrix depending on number of f and x remember x, k, x is always a vector, but f can also be a vector. If f is a scalar and a vector, they, they, they are different meaning, and sometimes this transpose you will see it here, depending on the situation actually. Okay, but essentially you constitute or create these components and put them together like this. Take a determinant and make it equal to zero, and interpret everything else is known because you already have a solution known to you by that time. X star, lambda star, all that is known to you. The only thing that is unknown is sigma actually. Okay, so we interpret this equation as a equation for sigmas, and then if sigma has all positive roots, when all such sigmas are positive, then it leads to minimum, and all such roots are negative, then it turns out to be maximum actually. Okay. And again, the proof part and all, I will not uh, go into that actually. So, we will just take it in a, on the face value sort of thing. Okay. But example, we will see, okay. and we will go back to that uh, that example, so very similar example actually. We will take uh, this, again this the quadratic function followed by this uh, constraint. This constraint is actually nothing but equation of a plane. Okay. So, solution approach is again very similar to what you have done before so as if we constitute j bar and then talk about these equations which comes from del j bar by del x 1 equal to 0, del j bar by del x 2 equal to 0, del j bar by del lambda equal to 0. So, once you have with this equation solve it and uh, you can just carry out the solution uh, yourself probably because x 1 has to be minus lambda, x 2 is plus lambda you substitute here minus lambda and uh, then uh, it is plus lambda. So, it is minus 2 lambda minus phi sort of thing. So, lambda happens to be minus phi by 2 and x 1 happens to be uh, minus lambda. So, phi by 2 and x 2 happens to be plus lambda which is minus phi by 2. All right. So, this is uh, how you get a solution. Now, the question is how do you go ahead and test it for the sufficiency condition basically. So, this is where we will we'll try to venture into this formula whatever you have here and this turns out to be like uh, okay. So, this is del square j by del x square happens to be identity matrix we have seen that before and del j by del x equal nothing but uh, 1 minus 1 okay, because del f is here f, del f by, by del x 1 is plus 1 del f by del x 2 is minus 1. So, the put, put them together is like this. So, I go back to this formula and tell okay, this is what I will put it here okay. and this is one remember this this formula what I gave you in general it is uh, when f is uh, f is uh, vector and x is vector, but here we have f is scalar. So, this transpose is not necessary. I mean in fact, this transpose come here actually. Really. This will this will become a, a column and this will become a row sort of thing actually. Okay. And that essentially comes from the definition if you go back to this uh, this Jacobian and uh, gradient vector and all that. If it is gradient vector, it is column vector. If it is Jacobian vector, Jacobian matrix, it uh, the similar partial derivatives are aligned in the row sense basically. That is the from that definition this difficulty comes actually in a way. But remember if it is both are I mean f is if f is a scalar then this transpose gets shifted here. Okay. So, with that assumption we will just go we just see that uh, okay, whatever these components are available. So, this will come here okay, and the transpose of that will come here okay, 1 minus 1 is here and 1 minus 1 will come here that way. So, now you have a determinant equation here and if you carry out the determinant and then turns out that it is a quadratic expression 
1 minus sigma whole square uh, equal to kind of 0 it will turn out to be actually ok. So, then uh, sigma is nothing but 1, 1 1 sort of thing actually and both are happens to be positive. So, hence this, this theorem tells you that if all the roots are positive then it is a minimum and hence whatever solution you got here this phi by 2 minus phi by 2 point happens to be a minimum point actually ok. Also, just a small comment if some this is actually the, the point that you are getting actually ok in a, in a picture sense uh, this is what I showed you here. What you are getting here is is the point, ok. But if somebody asks you what is the value of that particular function at that point, then you have to go back and evaluate this j of x and get a value for that, ok. So, that is uh, we implicitly assume actually that is possible because just a simple evaluation of the, the function that you ok. Some remarks uh, associated with this example, uh, in this example this variables x 1, x 2 and lambda do not appear in the equation for sigma ok, whatever sigma is there it is independent of that and hence it really does not depend uh, on which operating or which uh, candidate solution you are talking about and hence this result is happens to be global actually ok. And this solution is the only solution in that sense also it happens to be global actually. Okay. In general however, sigma will be a function of x and lambda and hence the various conclusions that uh, that you have seen here ok in this can this sense it can it can depend on which candidate solution you are talking about. So, around each candidate solution you have a set of sigmas and this set of sigmas has to satisfy certain condition like that actually. So, that analysis goes uh, that way and we will also give another example to demonstrate that actually. So, this is what the what the example is uh, ok this uh, ok in the in the constant optimization sense in sufficiency condition sense we will we will give this another example like that. So, if it is like this ok and subject to this, uh, this is a non-linear equation of mother, it is not a equation of a plane anymore, but probably something like a equation of a um, kind of a sphere actually ok. Uh, so, then uh, th this particular value I mean wh what you are talking about, I mean what you are talking about is, uh, is analyzing this particular problem. So, we will go back and formulate j bar, j bar is nothing but this plus lambda into that and then carry out the necessary algebra. And, so, and then like we'll end up with some candidate solution, but going ahead we will need this del square j bar by del x square and all that it will turn out to be like that. So, del f by del x also if, if you if you see this turns out to be 2 x 1 and 2 x 2 actually. So, now you put it back here all the necessary condition will will, set, will be like this and because it is a nonlinear equation sitting here and also this also is a nonlinear term, this also a nonlinear term remember that we will certainly have multiple candidate solution. And this candidate solution turns out to be 4 candidates ok and these 4 candidates happens you, you can quickly verify also you take uh, take this set of values and then put it you will satisfy all the equation you take uh, this one and put it it will satisfy actually so that way. But uh, in a solution sense we really need to solve it and get some candidate solutions all possible solutions actually ok. Now, it turns out that at each point we have to evaluate what the sigma values uh, are ok. And for that we have to do this uh, <laughs> ok, for that we have to take one particular thing and then then go back to this what is said ok this go back to this and then put it back here and then try to analyze what sigma values are those ok. So, that sense actually it happens to be. So, let us uh, talk a little bit on ok that part of it mm -hmm. All right. Uh, ok just to ok before well we will talk about that, but just to demonstrate your confidence and all let us talk about a verification of this uh, th this set of solution probably. So, we talk about 1, 0 and half ok. So, if I take uh, this is like 1 ok. So, this is 1 and but this is minus half actually here ok. So, minus half into into 2 basically. So, this is happens to be minus half into 2 so minus 1 multiplied with 1. So, it is still minus 1. So, 1 minus 1 is 0 basically. Okay. Now, what about this equation? Okay, this is the solution anyway. Okay. So, we are talking about x2 being 0. Okay. So, the x2 is 0 here. So, this equation is 0. I do not have to even look at other things. Okay. Now, what about this equation here? Okay. You, have, you have this x1 square plus x2 square. Okay. x1 square is 1 plus x2 square is 0. So, 1 plus 0 minus 1 is 0. So, this set of equations satisfy this equation actually again similar thing you can do it for this for this and all that, but in a in a solution sense again I have to be really careful for example, ok if I can demonstrate a little bit I think most of you know it anyway, but still 
Okay, see the solution sense you have to see this particular for example, either uh, you have to write either something like x 2 equal to 0 or lambda equal to 1. So, you have to see this kind of candidate solution sort of thing actually. Similarly, from that you can talk about uh, this one, this will take you either uh, okay, either uh, lambda is 0 or x 1 equal to uh, no not lambda is 0, either this this uh, no, no, we cannot talk about that. What you are talking about here, sorry, I just uh, think about that here. This, uh, for this equation tells us that uh, that lambda, oh, sorry, again this goes back and forth actually. Okay. It, this equation tells us that uh, lambda times x1 is nothing but minus half actually. Okay. So, you have to analyze these cases little bit carefully and then put it there, you probably can can have some cases case by case solutions and all that ready I, and I, I suggest that all of you do this exercise for heavy, I mean in a long and algebra sense so that you will get gain lot of confidence actually what you are doing this. Okay. And again I am not uh, recommending at all that you go to this uh, numerical solvers and all that actually nothing it, it, it can be done in say in pen and paper it is a fun algebra also to carry out actually. So, I suggest that you do it to yourself actually that way. Anyway, so you, you carry out this and then it turns out to be that uh, these are the candidate solutions. Okay. So, each of the candidate solution now we have to see what is going on. Now, we go back to that uh, whatever formula we had here to analyze. Okay. So, in that setting we have to put it here what is going on here. Okay. So, we take a first candidate solution probably and then think about putting it all this whatever variables are there we will substitute the corresponding values actually. Okay. So, if I take the first case actually this this particular case then turns out to be like this okay. then you evaluate this determinant and you evaluate using whatever either first row or first column whatever way actually I, may, I am evaluating that using first row let us say then it turns out to be like this into this 0 minus 0 this first term minus 1 minus sigma into this term into 0 which is 0 minus this term 0 into 0 is also 0. So, this is this term into 0 minus 0 okay, 0 into this determinant what you see here okay, uh, uh, sorry uh, this one this this determinant 0 0 2 0. So, obviously, one row is 0. So, this is 0 also basically. Okay. So, 0 into 0 sort of thing. So, that is what it is whatever the last term last term 2 into okay, this is 0 anyway, but minus 2 into this this term actually. So, that that is a, a candidate which is non 0 really. So, that equation tells you that everything is ok, I mean this is 0, this is 0, but this term gives me something like 4 into 3 plus sigma, this is uh, there 2 into 2, 1 minus sign I will take it from here. So, that is 4, 4 into 3 plus sigma is 0, so that means sigma equal to minus 3. So, what you are getting? We are getting one sigma, one candidate says sigma only and that sigma happens to be a negative quantity. So, obviously, we lead up a land up with a case which is a maximum case actually. So, at this point x 1 is 1 and 0, we have a local maximum basically. Similarly, I will carry out this uh, this analysis for all such points if and if you do that then you will end up with this uh, this table basically. So, this happens to be a maximum this happens to be also a maximum this and these two happens to be a minimum actually. Now, if you see this okay, if these are two maximum there are two maximums and two minimums we can always evaluate the function j again go back and see which is global maximum and which is global minimum actually okay, because, because if the maximum of these two will lead us to the, the point where the function takes a global maximum and minimum of the two will lead us to a point where the function takes a global minimum sort of thing. So, with this probably I will uh, stop here, but also before stopping uh, I will uh, suggest that uh, some of the concepts I have taken from these two books actually and uh, this I do not know whether it is uh, available in market or not. Uh, you can think about uh, if it is uh, available somewhere uh, uh, in uh, I think Amazon.com or something you can see that or uh, there is a good uh, website also that I typically use which is called bookfinder.com. So, it is it does not it does not necessarily search for only Amazon, but it searches all over the place who are part of that network and gives you some possibility if is, if somebody is selling a old book or something you can also buy from there actually. Yeah. Uh, typically those are available used books and all that are also available in the, from those things. 
and international shipping and all, all sorts of possible and I really do not know whether uh, and uh, an Indian print is available for this. It is also a old book sort of thing. But this I certainly know that is an Indian book, uh, Indian edition book is available. Uh, this is a Indian edition, but it is a I mean it is a global edition, but there is an Indian edition also available and it, uh, it has gone through some editions that means some uh, error corrections and all must have happened, some new chapters have come in and all that actually. So, this particular book uh, you can always uh, think of buying, it is not very expensive either basically. Now, this book uh, uh, latest edition as far as I remember, I know it is 2010 uh, and also remember these books are written for static optimization only. That means, uh, what you have seen here is all this uh, I mean long hand algebra and all that are typically not uh, reality because in many cases the, the, the objective, objective function and constraints are large dimension, they are uh, some nonlinear functions and all this. So, we cannot keep on doing this. So, it will go to this numerical idea of solving actually okay. and all these static optimization books will talk a lot about that uh, numerical optimization schemes. It will talk about various various ways of doing things in a proper way or in an efficient way or in a less iteration sense uh, I mean that kind of ideas will be there. If they talk about uh, line optimi line source algorithm for example, they also talk about conjugate gradient source, they talk about uh, uh, steep edge descent algorithm things like that actually. Okay. So, we will see little bit of that ideas uh, especially about steep edge descent in the next lecture, but uh, this particular book is uh, very useful for those of you who want to kind of develop your knowledge. Uh, in the in the static optimization side of the story. Again, all many other books are also available. I am not uh, recommending only this. And if you happen to like uh, something, some other book, it's uh, you are also welcome to see that actually. All right. So uh, with this, I'll probably stop this uh, this lecture here. Thanks a lot for your attention.